Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 7 of Little Free Library Unbound. We're really happy to have you here with us today. In case you missed it in the chat, my colleague Shelby has shared some tips for the best viewing experience. Since we have slides and a couple of speakers, you'll want to select the side-by-side -side speaker view in the top right corner of your Zoom screen. And then you can hover over the line that divides the parts of the screen to make one bigger or smaller. And that is usually a pretty good way to see everything that we have going on. So this month, um, we are talking about the summer slide and how the definitions and the understanding of that concept has changed. And we have some really exciting guests. So we're super happy to have you here with us today. Um, and we are going to get started with a couple of new polls this time. So we know that a lot of the people who view Little Free Library Unbound are stewards and Little Free Library users, but we're gonna get a little more specific with our poll this time. Um, so we've got two questions. Have you heard the term summer slide before? You can answer yes or no. And then um, if you are a steward, and I realize I don't have um, an option for folks who aren't stewards here, but if you are not a steward, you might answer um, based on your local Little Free Library. Um, which ages you think your library primarily serves and you can choose all that apply. it would be interesting to see the differences between age groups and different communities that Little Free Libraries of our viewers today are serving. Looks like we have a lot of folks with younger kids. And we're kind of, we have a lot of folks who know about Summer Slide, but some folks who don't, it's kind of jumping toward the middle there. We've got just about everyone has voted, so we will share the results. So you can see that 65% of those watching um, have heard the term summer slide before and 35% have not. So we'll have a really good time talking a little bit more about what that means, what it has meant, and what it means now with some new research. And um, we can see that most of the people watching today either regularly use the library or have a little free library that serves kids six to 10 um, and lots in the zero to five range too. So lots of young kids, but also a lot of um, adults and teens too. So there's a huge range here, which is really cool. All right, next, I would like to introduce our national board chair, Anina Marina, who is our fabulous uh, moderator for Little Free Library Unbound. Welcome, Anita. Hello and away. welcome everyone. <laughs> so nice to see you and happy summer. I just can't believe that it's summer already and time has just flown by. So a lot of a lot of challenges for us uh, post pan well not really post pandemic, but just in a new um, new era for all of us. So I welcome you to our chapter seven, combating summer side and also engaging middle age middle grade and YA readers. So the first question, a lot of you already know the answer based on the poll, but what is Summer Slide? Summer Slide describes the loss of reading skills when children experience over the summer months um, a loss of uh, when they're not in school. And so that begins to, you know, sort of uh, ratchet down. Um, the factors at play when uh, with Summer Slide is one, access to books, uh, two is engagement with and access to informal educational activities. And three is reading motivation. So these are um, principal factors. The source is scholastic.com. And uh, they, they do a great raising a reader uh, section. Um, but what can stewards do or what are stewards instrumental in doing? Little Free Library book exchanges do a lot of things to help kids beat the summer slide. One study show that access to books during the summer presents a drastic uh, loss and uh, prevents a drastic loss in reading skills, especially for kids in need. And we all know that that's often book access is difficult. So children with book access over the summer perform 35 to 40% better on reading achievement tests than children without books. And that critical moment of access to books is, um, is so important. 
And three, a child from a home with just 25 books will complete, more, complete two more years of school than a child from a home without any books at all. And we've seen that so many of our wonderful stewards out there are trying to address that by placing various books within their little free libraries and making it accessible in various ways, whether it's parks or school grounds or neighborhoods or their own homes. And what can students do on slide? One is giveaway book buddies, small stuffed animals kids can practice reading aloud too. Um, that's always fun. You always, my, my daughter loves a hedgehog. So um, she used to read to a little hedgehog. Two is offer prizes for completed books. Um, three, deck out your library with a fun summer theme. I've seen so many of them on Pinterest and other locations. Um, four, host a story time. That's always, always fun. Your library becomes a little destination location. Five, start an action book club with your neighbors, and that's a lot of community service uh, stuff and uh, community service activities or ways in which you can engage your neighbors. And six, kids can't resist reading, including books like the track series by Jason Reynolds, who I love, front desk series by Kelly Yang, the Penderwick series by Jean Birdsall, Harry Potter series, graphic novels like New Kid or Drama, you know, books that you found and loved and books that you've heard of from your young neighbors. Those are always ways, keep your ear to the ground. That's always a good way to, to do some sharing. So what should stewards know? Um, well, this is, a, this is a great information uh, gathered by a couple of our, our folks, um, our board member. Um, we have, this is from Kenneth Kun, Dr. Kenneth Kunz. He's shared uh, some new research with us that's featured in the second edition of the Summer Reading, Closing the Rich, Poor Reading Gap, Achievement Gap. And these points were of particular interest to us. And so we wanted to, to show, somebody said book walks, that's always fun, doing a little book scavenger hunt, book walks. So this particular book, Summer Reading, Closing the Rich Slash Poor Reading Achievement Gap um, is, is offering up some good points. One is we love bookmobile programs, but while bookmobile programs have helped with access to books during the summer, programs have diminished due to lack of funding. So as you are out there in the community, advocate for these really, really wonderful bookmobile uh, programs. Those are always helpful. Um, the other thing is choosing four to five books to read during the summer. Those can maintain school year academic success because it kind of gets, you know, your fellow kids and neighbors uh, continuing to reading because reading gains double when, when students have a choice for them. So when they're finding books and loving them, when they're looking through your little free libraries and thinking that's, that's, um, something that they want to see. Um, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm hopefully my, you can still hear me. Um, then students from low socioeconomic backgrounds lose on average two months of learning while more advantaged students gain a month. Um, that's always, always good. And again, that's a book access issue. And then top choices are series books, pop culture and sports biographies, funny books, books with visual features, high interest nonfiction and graphic novels. Those are always, always ways to, um, to get them. So thanks, Dr. Ken, we, we, act, we love him on the board. He's always a source of great information and enthusiasm for the rest of us. So we, um, speaking of wonderful books and ways that you engage people and students and uh, your neighbors and so on, the author community is just, full of exciting people and vibrant minds and uh, ideas and just characters that are engaging. And so I'd love to introduce to you our special guest, uh, Angela Dominguez. And Angela is the author and illustrator of several books for children and a two-time recipient of the Pura del Play Illustration Honor, her award-winning debut series, uh, middle grade novel, Stella Diaz has something to say. It's a first in the Stella Diaz series. 
And Angela is currently working on the fourth book in this series, which is really wonderful, Stella Diaz to the Rescue, which comes out next year, and then new picture books, including Tengo Hambre, I'm Hungry, of wonderful bilingual books. So we are so pleased to have you, Angela. You can see her wonderful books. Uh, I love them all. So I love these characters and it's so much fun. So we have a first question for you, Angela, and also for everyone to answer in the chat. What did having books or not having books mean to you as a child? Um, what are your experiences? Well, first of all, thank you so much for including me in today's discussion. Um, for me, you know, I'm very similar to my Stella Diaz character where I am an immigrant. I moved to the United States when I was two years old with my family and I struggled with language. And so I had an easy time reading, but speaking out loud, you know, I would always kind of stumble a little bit, mispronounce words, kind of got my English and my Spanish jumbled up together. I also take speech classes until third grade. So for me, books were a place that I could explore my imagination. It was also kind of an escape. And not only that, it was much easier to read a word than to say it out loud. And so I developed a real uh, kinship with books. And my mom was had like always gave me access, whether it was purchasing a new book or going to the library. And it just it's what has formed me and also impacted so much of my career today. Great. Yes. And we're so glad to have you. You're doing the same for, for your young readers. What drew you to writing children's and middle grade books? What, what um, really prompted you to say, you know what, this is, this is a wonderful field and arena for me to, to use my writing talents and ideas. Well, I studied illustration. I went to art school, uh, art college, to learn to become an illustrator. And I felt like I wanted to do serious work, but then I realized I love children's books. And um, that was kind of the gateway into writing children's book. Once I started illustrating the pictures for books, I realized I wanted to tell the stories with them too. And part of it is that I guess in a way I never 100% grew up. It's the things that I enjoy reading. I love um, cute characters. But what I also think is really significant is you know, books that we read as children stay with us forever. They impact our personalities. They help us discover new things about ourselves. We develop these friendships with these characters. They let us experience things that we might not experience, but get an opportunity to see how someone else is living. So I think that um, impact on children, I think is so significant to me that the idea that I could play a small role in that, it's been so amazing. And that's why I love writing children's books. Oh, thank you. Well, and you know, kids like me, we see ourselves in books mm -hmm. like yours. I think that's so exciting. And you're right about it resonating because I remember going to New York as an adult looking for these automa automatic you know, food vendors that I think Southern California, you don't have things like that. Mm -hmm. But because I saw them in a book, I thought, okay, or fire escapes, you know, that Francie would sit on a fire escape. Yeah. I always looked for that. So that was really so, so precious. Um, so a lot of kids, for them, sometimes reading isn't as easy. Um, sometimes they struggle and sometimes the words don't come easily or, you know, trying to understand what's on the page um, is, is hard. Um, have you ever yourself struggled with reading and how did you overcome that or how did you have you have you helped others do that and when of course you know you as an author go to to schools and libraries what do you say to kids who say you know what I really it's really hard for me to get into a book or understand what to do what is your, what is your feedback on that I think there should be no judgments with reading I think if kids should read whatever they're interested in, whether it's nonfiction, a graphic novel, if it has more pictures than writing, it's still reading because you're reading with visual pictures. And for them, it just might be that they need to work on their reading ability. And But how are they ever going to get to that point if they don't enjoy holding the book and enjoying it and getting into a story? And so, some kids just strictly like nonfiction and they want to learn things. And I feel for them, you know, just encourage that. 
I don't think there should be a label of what reading group or what a child should be reading, just have them reading and that will get them interested. I know for myself, whenever I'm struggling a little bit with wanting to read, it's usually when I try to learn a new subject or, you know, get a book on something silly pop culture related. And that totally appeals as well to kids as well. So I think just not having labels, letting kids read what they want to read and that will help. Yeah. Having a nice little, little hook. Um, do you have advice for little free library stewards who are trying to keep um, young kids motivated to read during the summer months, you know, again, getting back to your fun aspect. And, and then after that, I got a couple of questions in the chat. So um, okay. yeah. So during the summer months, was there, you know, I know the pull of the beach or the pull of something else, but reading's also kind of an escape. Are there things that you, you've done to kind of help kids get, stick with it? I think just getting to know them a little bit, have a conversation with them, find out books that they already like or subject matters that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then saying, oh, I have this recommendation for you. Like you like this character, what about this character? And I think anything that speaks to what they like and what they're interested in is gonna encourage them to continue reading. Especially I think kids love series. So if you tell them you love this book and there's <laughs> eight more of them, they're gonna get yeah. so excited about it. Yeah, we have a question from the chat and th this is for you, Angela. So do you start first with a story concept or an artwork prompt when you're creating a new book? Um, it's a little bit of both, you know, I never really intended to write middle uh, middle grade. I love it so much. And, you know, I grew up reading Ramona and I just thought that was like one of my favorite characters. And so I feel very lucky to be writing a book similar to that. but. Um, I think for me, you know, I was just writing picture books. I came up with a character design that looks like Stella, curly hair, polka dot dress, and tried to write it as a picture book, but it didn't quite work because we didn't really know who this character was and why she was shy and why she was struggling with uh, making new friends or finding her voice. And so that's when I, uh, I realized it needed to be a longer book. So mm -hmm. sometimes it is definitely an art prompt. Sometimes I, I might just think of a, a concept in my head that's like funny to me. And then I just do it like um, the most recent book, Thank Hombre, which comes out next year. I just thought it'd be so much fun to do a dinosaur book. And then I <laughs> then I thought about what if the dinosaur is very picky eater? And mm -hmm. that kind of led to the whole concept of the story. So it, it it's a little bit of both. Um, it depends on how I'm feeling, but a drawing can always lead to writing. And that's also a big tip that I share with kids. Um, you know, if they're struggling with writing, just as they might be struggling with reading, I encourage them to draw and tell stories with their pictures and then try writing it. And they might be more excited to write then too. Yeah. Cause it can take them in a, in a fun new direction. Um, what do you like to read? What are you reading right now? Well, um, I just moved into a new house, so I was spending so much time prior to moving, reading so many books, but I feel like right now my head is a little bit of a blur, and I can't remember uh, the last book that I read. I read so many graphic novels because I'm really interested in the idea of writing and illustrating one. Um, so I think one of my favorite books that I read recently was um, Team... Palm Squid Happens. It's by oh. my friend Isabel Rojas. Okay. It's about girls who are um, professional or semi-professional aspiring circa nice swimmers that make friends with a squid. And it's just so funny and beautifully illustrated. And it just came out and I recommend everyone check that one out. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, there was a question in the chat about rejections, you know, uh, as an author, like many authors, you have to deal with uh, rejections. Have have you ha how have you coped with it? Um, have you had that? And how do you keep going and and writing and and uh, you know uh, follow your still follow your muse on writing? Well, um, Stella was actually a rejection. So when I tried yeah. to write as a picture book, they rejected it. And so I think sometimes. Rejection is always challenging and I do like to tell everyone that, you know, I still even experience it. It's just part of 
being creative and putting yourself out there. And you just have to learn how to kind of manage that feelings. Um, but I think what it often allows me to do is try to envision the project in a different way. So it, if it gets rejected, I mean, I, you hear stories of all the time of somebody else shopping at somewhere else and it does get picked up, which is great. But for me, what I try to go is what is not working? What can I try to redo or reinterpret so that it's now a stronger story? And then also if it gets rejected and I don't feel anything, that kind of lets me know that maybe I wasn't as excited about the story as I thought. Uh, okay, that's good. That's really good advice. Um, Shelby has shared your website and uh, your Twitter feeds and all your links. I just have one last question for you and um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on with Mackenzie. But one question I did is, you know, you've got bilingual books out there. You've got Tango Amre, you've got, you know, words in Spanish. How is it, how does it feel? And what do you think about, you know, more kids are seeing their languages in books or words that they recognize. Um, as somebody who came over and, and speaks uh, two languages, how does that make you feel now seeing um, more multilingual books out there, bilingual and so on? And so many words you recognize. Well, I think um, it feels wonderful to see it. Um, I know growing up, uh, being caught between two cultures, I felt kind of alone and a little isolated. And so as I wrote um, Stella or I've written the bilingual book, seeing so many kids connected with the books and seeing a word and getting excited and saying it out loud and sharing it with their classmates or their teacher that they know that word and they feel so proud. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's just an amazing feeling. You know, I didn't really intend to go in this direction so much. I just started incorporating it, but seeing the response, it's really just encouraged me to do it more. And then, you know, I think doing the school visits, I've had once or twice, probably my most fa m favorite moment was I visited a school for the Virginia Book Festival and these group of girls all had my last name, Dominguez, and they were so excited to meet me and to hug me and I realized I never saw my last name on a book I didn't really see too many Latino authors on the cover of a book so, uh, the name so I, I realized what a big impact that is and it allows them the opportunity to dream big for themselves and to envision themselves as potentially an author or an illustrator one day so all of it all together it's just like a, a truly wonderful special feeling yeah, that's so good. Well, keep writing because we're all hungry for what you what you share and the worlds that you're introducing us to and sharing and um, and kids are, are seeing themselves and that is so, so very precious. So thank you again, Angela. We'll, we'll follow you and hopefully we'll, we'll come back to you again sometime. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Gracias. De nada. <laughs> <laughs> so next, I'd love to introduce you to one of our wonderful stewards. Um, at this young age, you know, she's already making a huge difference. I'm in my old age. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, I'd like to, rec to uh, welcome Mackenzie Cox. Mackenzie is a high school senior and the steward of multiple Little Free Libraries in the Concord, North Carolina area. You can see what she's doing there. She was a 2021 nominee for the Todd H. Bowl Award for Outstanding Achievement. And the list of her accomplishments goes on and on and on. I am, again, jealous. <laughs> Mackenzie is also the founder of an organization called Road. Reading Opens All Doors, the mission of which is to increase book access and eliminate illiteracy in North Carolina. So welcome, Mackenzie. So, so glad to have you here. <laughs> Hello, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed hearing from Ms. Dominguez as well. It was very insightful. So I'm just glad to be part of the conversation. Yeah, we lear we're, we're learning a lot and I'm sure we'll learn from you as well. Um, so we'll start in with you. Um, and okay. Shelby has already uh, put in a link for your nonprofit. So what does having books or what did not having books around mean to you as a young person? How does that resonate for you, that question? So I'm very thankful that I've had access to books as a child and that's really what 
fueled my love for reading. I was thankful that it did start in my home, but I distinctly remember watching a story on the news. They were doing an investigative report on the book desert in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is actually one of the more severe in the United States, especially in my region. And I remember thinking how unfortunate it was that some children didn't have the opportunity to build that love for reading that I had because one of my most firm beliefs is that once you learn how to read, you can find a book that will teach you how to do anything else that you're looking to do. It's a great stepping stone. So that's when I started gravitating towards founding a nonprofit and collecting and redistributing books. So I'm thankful for the opportunities I had by having books in my home. And I'm looking to expand that through my state. So what drew you to Little Free Libraries? What got you, how did you find out about them? And you know, what got you interested in, in creating that avenue for book access? Of course, so I had been volunteering with several other literacy organizations in the area, and I was looking to create some kind of experience that would draw kids back to reading and it would get them engaged. Because there are so many different situations that you encounter when you're trying to tackle problem as big as illiteracy, as multifaceted. And so I wanted something that was going to engage the kids. And I always knew about Little Free Libraries. I thought that they were so unique, but I personally, I'm not the most handy with, um, with some of the tools. So I started using, um, I can't remember who it was that gave us the idea, but taking old newspaper bins that were donated from different newspaper suppliers and putting books inside instead and painting them and creating, you know, having the kids pull down the door and pick the book that they like it it really appealed to me of being able to increase the access to books and have the kids be excited about going to read. So I think that's what really drew me to the organization and to starting to become a steward. Well, oh, thank you. Well, we are so lucky to have you. Um, <laughs> now for you, have you ever struggled with reading and, and, and struggled to stay engaged? And were there ways in which you overcame that or someone helped you overcome that? And if you haven't, did you have you known somebody who had that experience and, you know, how have you helped them as well? So I am human. I do struggle at times <laughs> to stay engaged with reading. I am a rising senior in high school. And so recently I found myself in the situation where I'm reading a lot for class and I'm not reading as much for fun or for joy and entertainment. So that's something that I'm trying to work on, especially during the summer is reading more books that really speak to me. Um, which is always a fun project to take on. But my grandmother, when I was younger, she was um, she's a retired teacher. And so she helped me with reading. And I think she's really who helped me connect those dots and stay engaged when I was younger. So having someone that can really help you and open those doors for you, it was, I think, that started on your reading journey. Well, and retired teachers and retired librarians and current mm -hmm. librarians, everybody who's the, a book lover and a book champion, they're just amazing. So um, mm -hmm. it's always Definitely. fun. And they always are creative. And speaking of creativity, do you have any special activities or, at, you know, do you add in different types of books in your during in your little free libraries during the summer to kind of get kids excited. Um, what have you noticed that's been most successful in your efforts to get uh, local kids engaged? So we're always rotating the books that we have in the little free library, trying to make sure that we're keeping a fresh supply and that the books are changing out in case we do have those frequent visitors who are coming often. We love to see that. But I think what's been most successful is actually doing a lot of research on the locations that I put my little free libraries in and knowing the kind of activities that they have. My most frequented library is at one of the minor league baseball stadiums in my hometown um, for the Kannapolis Cannonballers. And they're having a lot of activities this summer and they draw a really young audience. So that's been really successful having the library there and making sure there are books for all ages, but especially for younger children, because that's a place that they tend to gravitate towards. So doing research on the front end definitely helps me to create engaging And minor league teams uh, are a great way to reach families and, and young people. So and I remember at one of the minor league stadiums near here, you know, you've got a whole midway area. So tip for you stewards out there, contact your local minor league team, the, the way in which you can even showcase um, a little free library, your partnership with the public libraries. 
you know, for athletes, they've got to stay fit during some of these seasons. You can, you know, have, to have athletes talk about staying fit uh, in the literacy end of things. What books do they love to read or have them do some fun challenges, um, you know, books on balls or something like that, if, you know, challenges strike out for so many books and, and so on. So, um, you know, whether it's hockey or soccer. I need to yeah, write this no, down. <laughs> I, when I was, I used to do uh, with major league soccer, get a kick out of reading. So the soccer teams, and I don't know if you know that a lot of um, women's soccer players, professional soccer players, they often had jobs as, you know, teachers or early childhood uh, folks and, you know, some of their background has always been in, um, in reading and kids and so on. So there's a lot to kind of tap into with that. Um, but let's talk to you about your reading habits. What do you like to read? What's fun for you? And what are you reading right now? What's on your bookshelf? I have really varied taste in books. So see, right now, I, I told you I'm in one of those phases where I'm doing a lot of school reading for my upcoming English class, Literature and Composition, which I'm very excited about. So right now, I'm reading two books at once, um, The Handmaid's Tale and The Joy oh. Love Club. Um, I'm more into The Handmaid's Tale than the other. I say no spoilers in the <laughs> chat, please. Don't ask me questions that will that'll tell me the answers. Um, <laughs> but I'm enjoying those, um, which is definitely fun and refreshing. And as far as just if I was to go somewhere and pick a book off the shelf, I tend to gravitate towards um, not so much nonfiction, but things that explore different concepts or different issues, social issues. I like when I read to learn something that I can take and then apply to my life, something that makes me feel smarter, like a better human, all of those things. <laughs> Where do you get your books? Where do you find the books that you place in your libraries? So the books that I put in my libraries, I collect through my nonprofit organization. I host book drives throughout the local area. Um, we'll often set up in small businesses or we've done book drives like our, our local courthouse before. And we'll set out a box and it runs for about one to two weeks and people can come and they'll bring books. And I've also found a lot of success in advertising on social media. Because my organization is a 501c3, um, we do offer tax deductions for donations. I will advertise that we're collecting books in the local area. I'll go to their house. I'll pick them up, whatever is needed. Um, and we'll take those and I'll sort them out by, you know, kind of ages and genre. And I'll take those and rotate them into the library. So that's how I acquire those. And how many little free libraries do you have now? I'm getting ready to install my 11th. What? So we're, I'm very excited about that. We're spreading out. Um, a lot of them are located in the county I go to school in and the county I live in. And we're trying to spread out. Um, I'd love to get some on Eastern North Carolina and maybe further up into the mountain region. So I'm looking at new possibilities for that to really take it statewide. And are most of them in um, near school grounds or parks or is it a variety of locations that you have them? I would say a variety. We talked about the one at the baseball stadium, but I have um, some at schools, small businesses like dance studios or um, okay clothing stores in like downtown areas. I have one at the Central Recreation Center in Thomasville where they have youth programs that they run. So just trying to find places that attract families or attract young children because I, my libraries do mostly serve those age ranges. Uh -huh. Just trying to find places to meet them where they are and remove all those barriers to access. I want to find a place where it'll be easy for them to use the services. Are there family organizations that you also like to work with, folks who work with parents and so on, and mm -hmm. um, how, uh, how do you work with them and how helpful are they are in reaching kind of the kids? And then also, um, it's also fun for parents to get engaged and helping them. And they may be intimidated too, but ways in which you can help them realize there's nothing to be intimidated about there. So how do you work with these kinds of organizations? Mm -hmm. So I partner currently with the Boys and Girls Club of the Piedmont to offer books for, um, I guess you would call it their youth program, their children's programs. And I'm looking into, um, if anyone here is from North Carolina, in the Statesville area, I've been doing a lot of work there recently to partner with the Iredale County Partnership for Young Children. I just installed a Little Free Library there, and they offer services for young families and for parents, as well as programs for children. And so that's something that's relatively new. It just started at the end of the school year. And I'm very excited for that because it is one of the more family service oriented approaches that I've been able to, to take. And I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. I'd love to do more of that. 
Great. Well, that's amazing what you're doing. Thank um, you. A question through the chat also uh, came okay. through about the Little Free Libraries. Are they all newspaper dispensers, those fun little ones that I've, I've seen as well? Um, are all of those the kind that you've been finding? Yeah, so all of the all of the libraries that I have placed are newspaper bins. Um, the kind that you pull down, you, we take off the dispensers where you used to have to put the quarters in. No need for that. Um, and that would kind of defeat the purpose um, of a little free library. But we take those off. And so my dad's very, he's great at helping me with that. Um, and all of the, you can just pull them down after that and get the books inside. But that is, um, I've been able to have those donated, fortunately, by reaching out to local newspaper companies and distributors. And I've even had some people who aren't using their bins anymore and we clear it with the agency that brought them the bin and I've been able to use those. So it, it's been easier than I would have thought to acquire them. I was, that was my first concern is how am I gonna get all these newspaper bins? Yeah. <laughs> but thankfully that's worked out. Yeah. So um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your nonprofit road. How mm -hmm. did you develop it? How, how does working a nonprofit work? I'm sure that, um, a lot of stewards out there are thinking of doing the same thing or have one. Um, is there advice that you can give or tips on creating one or maintaining it or making sure that it's running well? Absolutely. So the guidelines are just a little bit different in each state. So I can't speak too much to what it would look like for you specifically to form one, but the best place I can direct you to is your government website. And there are usually different articles online that you can find that will walk you through step by step. But the reason I just started to, I decided to found my own nonprofit was I, I founded it at 14 and there weren't a lot of places that were taking youth volunteers to help. And so I wanted a place where I could get involved more with literacy, where my friends could get involved. Um, I partnered with my school several times to host um, like paint-a-thons for the little free libraries and different things. I wanted it to be a community-based approach to a community problem. Yeah. And so I made sure that um, it was something that everyone could get involved with. Because I believe if you have the drive and you have the passion, there should be no barriers that stop you from helping to solve these problems. So that was really the choice. Um, those were the reasons that I made the choice I did. My best advice would be to find what makes you different. Find something that will differentiate you from all of the other similar organizations, whatever that may be. That's great. And um, an effort to do diverse books as well. Because I would mm -hmm. imagine that the areas that you are doing is, is uh, you know, filled with diverse populations too. I, I think that mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. And I, how could you have all that energy and, <laughs> and ideas at 14? But um, I'm thankful for the that. support. It's <laughs> not all an individual <laughs> thing. It takes some. Um, obviously, being 17, I'm very thankful for my parents helping me yeah. to make those choices and helping me when I couldn't drive, helping me get places to volunteer. And as I mentioned, my grandmother and my family. So I'm very grateful for that. I can't take all the credit there. <laughs> well, it, it, it sounds really <laughs> terrific. And I know you're the same as so many of our stewards out there. It's really a labor of love. And so we thank you very, very much, Mackenzie. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you in our Facebook groups and in our stories throughout. If you want to follow Road, you can follow our Facebook. Uh, Shelby's put a lot of the contact information there. Um, if everybody's in, in North Carolina, you know who to go to to help. Um, Mackenzie's always looking for help. Really? <laughs> help, et cetera. <laughs> always. So thank you so much. I'm sure we'll see you down the road. All right. Thank, thank you, you for having me. So we are so appreciative of all of our wonderful guests. Um, again, this is... This is just always so much fun for me to, to meet all these wonderful panelists. If you've enjoyed this chapter of Little Free Library, Little Free Library Unbound, um, please, please consider a financial contribution to help us continue to offer these free events, um, donations to our nonprofit. They also support our steward services activities so we can create resources and opportunities and help our stewards like Mackenzie and reach out to authors like Angela. Um, you can donate at littlefeelibrary.org slash donate. And always know that we have uh, previous uh, as well as this one, this um, Little Free Library Unbound Digital uh, on our um, YouTube as well. And take it away, Lexi.
Thank you, Anita. Again, this was another wonderful month. It is always so cool when we can connect different types of book people like our stewards and authors like Angela. And um, it is always a pleasure. Uh, and next month, we are going to have more of that. Um, in chapter eight, we'll be talking to three authors who have little free libraries. Um, and there are so many authors that have little free libraries. There are a couple different articles about it that we'll share next month. Um, but it's very cool to see how authors um, maintain their little free libraries and the kind of books they add and the different ways they get connected with their communities. Um, you may remember from our February episode, Kate DiCamillo is um, an author in Minneapolis and she has a little free library as well. So uh, we won't be having, having Kate back again. She's busy, busy, but we've got some other great authors we're going to be chatting with, which should be a lot of fun. And Shelby has shared the registration link for chapter eight in the chat. So you can sign up to join us and you'll get reminders um, when that comes up. For those of you who joined us today, you'll receive an email tomorrow with a survey for you to share your feedback about this month's event. Um, and we're excited to give away copies of Angela Dominguez's first novel in the Stella Diaz series. Stella Diaz has something to say to 10 folks who um, fill out that survey for us. So if you haven't already fallen in love with the Stella Diaz series, this will be an opportunity to get started there. Or if you already love it, um, an opportunity to share a copy in your little free library. So we think that it'll be a great opportunity to catch up on the series while you're waiting for the next book to come out. Um, related to the summer slide, Next week, the International Literacy Association, the ILA, is hosting a web webinar be called Tackling Tough Issues with Middle Grade Literature that looks super interesting. I'm really looking forward to it and have registered already. Um, it's a free event and you can register at the link in the chat. Um, it just popped up in my email in an ILA newsletter and I thought that is perfect to share this month. Um, and Shelby has shared that in the chat. And finally, if you haven't already, please follow us on our social media and um, join our newsletter so you can stay up to date with Little Free Library and our different programs and activities. Shelby is sharing those links in the chat as well. And as always, if you have questions, comments, concerns, or ideas for future chapters of LFL Unbound, you can reach me at unbound at littlefreelibrary.org. We look forward to hearing your feedback and thank you again for joining us this month.